Good day, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our channel. Miracle in Jerusalem. The signs of God at the Holy Seer. It's Jesus. From the Holy Siler, a roar mixed with joy and tears. In a few minutes, it spread throughout the Basilica. From the candles of the Greek Patriarch, the Church of the Holy Siler, also referred to as the Church of the Resurrection, remains a beacon of spiritual devotion and historical reverence in the heart of Jerusalem's old city. Christians receive God's revelation through His miracles here. What has happened inside the Holy Church? What mystery does this Holy Siler hold? Let's try to answer this question to see what you know about it. What is the significance of the Church of the Holy Siler? A. It's the oldest church in Jerusalem. B. It's dedicated to the Apostle Peter. C. It commemorates the Last Supper. D. It marks Jesus' crucifixion and burial. Time to think, and remember to give the answer below. We are going to discuss it together. A miracle at the Church of the Holy Siler. This phenomenon might shock all religious people all over the world. Is this hard evidence of the resurrection? When scientists were recently permitted to open up the place believed to have been the tomb of Christ in the Church of the Holy Siler in Jerusalem, there are rumors that the scientists immediately smelled a sweet aroma when they opened the tomb, reminiscent of the old factory manifest, a commonly associated with both Marian and saintly apparitions. Those rumors haven't been confirmed, but something similar was reported the last time the tomb was opened in 1809. Not only that, it was alleged that some of the measuring instruments used by scientists were altered by electromagnetic disturbances as soon as they were placed vertically on the stone in which Christ's body rested. The devices either malfunctioned or ceased to work at all. If reports about the scent make scientists not 100% sure, then they are much less hesitant regarding the electromagnetic disturbances recorded by the scientists' instruments. The phenomena were confirmed by one of the scientists authorized to access the tea. Later, one of the heads of the Bing and construction team, Antonia Moru, indicated that it is really hard to imagine that someone would be willing to put his or her reputation in danger just because of a publicity stunt. Moreover, the journalist testifies to the scientists' surprise during the opening of the slab. They hoped that the grave would be much lower than it was previously performed analyses with the instruments seemed to have been distorted by an electromagnetic disturbance. God's miracles did not stop there. Every year on Holy Saturday, a miracle takes place in the Church of the Holy Siler in Jerusalem. The miracle of the Holy Fire has taken place at the same time, in the same manner, in the same place every single year for centuries. It is said that on Holy Saturday, the day before Easter Sunday, a miraculous event known as the Holy Fire Ceremony occurs in the Church of the Holy Siler in Jerusalem. This tradition has been celebrated for centuries and is considered one of the most extraordinary manifestations of Divine Presence. According to believers, the miracle of the Holy Fire begins when the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem enters the Edicule, a small chapel within the church that is said to enclose the tomb of Jesus Christ. The Patriarch enters alone and prays in complete darkness, asking for the descent of the Holy Fire. Witnesses gather outside the Edicule, anxiously awaiting the miraculous event. Suddenly, without any apparent source, flames ignite from the Patriarch's hands, symbolizing the descent of the Holy Fire. The Patriarch then lights candles and shares the Holy Fire with the faithful, who use it to light their own candles and lanterns. The flame is believed to be miraculously cool to the touch and produce healing properties. The holy fire is considered a symbol of Jesus Christ's resurrection and a sign of God's presence among his followers. Pilgrims from around the world travel to Jerusalem to witness this extraordinary event and receive the blessing of the holy fire. The continuity and consistency of the holy fire miracle have baffled scientists and skeptics over the years, with many unable to provide a rational explanation for its occurrence. Despite attempts to debunk or replicate the miracle, it remains a mystery that continues to inspire awe and devotion among believers. No other miracle is known to occur so regularly and so steadily over time.
The holy fire originates as a divine light that manifests on the marble slab covering the stone bed upon which Jesus' body was placed for burial. Though there are various experiences by different people at various times in history, it then changes to a fire that does not behave as normal fire. Though it can be transferred from candle to candle, for a time, it will not burn or damage what it touches. Other phenomena which have been witnessed before the manifestation of the holy fire include lightning-like flashes above the shrine of the tomb of Christ and swiftly moving balls of light. Beginning in the afternoon of Holy Friday, pilgrims wait in anticipation for the miracle, camped as close to the holy siler as possible. Beginning at around 11 a.m. in the morning, the Christian Arabs chant traditional hymns in a loud voice. These chants date back to the Turkish occupation of Jerusalem in the 13th century, a period in which the Christians were not allowed to chant anywhere but in the churches. They chant at the top of their voices, accompanied by the sound of drums. The drummers sit on the shoulders of others who dance vigorously around the holy kaboom. But at 1 or p.m., the chants fade out, and then there is a tense silence charged with the anticipation of the great demonstration of God's power for all to witness. Shortly thereafter, a delegation from the local authorities elbows its way through the crowd. At the time of the Turkish occupation of Palestine, they were Muslim Turks, today, they are Israelis. Their function is to represent the Romans. At the time of Jesus, the Gospels speak of the Romans who went to seal the tomb of Jesus so that his disciples would not steal his body and claim he had risen. In the same way, the Israeli authorities on this holy Saturday come and seal the tomb with wax. Before they seal the door, they follow the custom of entering the tomb to check for any hidden source of fire which would make a fraud of the miracle. Might you wonder how the miracle occurred? Listen to this account of Patriarch Diodorus, who was Patriarch from 1981 to 2000, normally, the miracle happens immediately after I have said the prayers. From the core of the very stone on which Jesus lay, an indefinable light pours forth. It usually has a blue tint, but the color may change and take many different hues. It cannot be described in human terms. The light rises out of the stone as mist may rise out of a lake. It almost looks as if the stone is covered by a moist cloud, but it is light. This light each year behaves differently, sometimes it covers just the stone, while other times it gives light to the whole siler so that people who stand outside the tomb and look into it will see it filled with light. The light does not burn, I have never had my beard burnt in all the 16 years I have been patriarch in Jerusalem and have received the holy fire. The light is of a different consistency than normal fire that burns in an oil lamp. At a certain point, the light rises and forms a column in which the fire is of a different nature, so that I'm able to light my candles from it. When I thus have received the flame on my candles, I go out and give the fire first to the Armenian Patriarch and then to the Coptic. Hereafter, I give the flame to all people present in the church. When the Patriarch comes out with the two candles lit and shining brightly in the darkness, a roar of jubilee resounds in the church. The miracle is not confined to what actually happens inside the little tomb where the Patriarch prays. For the blue light that is reported to appear and be active outside the tomb, every year, many believers claim that this miraculous light ignites candles which they hold in their hands of their own initiative. All in the church wait with candles in the hope that they may ignite spontaneously, often unlit oil lamps catch light by themselves before the eyes of the pilgrims. The blue flame is seen to move in different places in the church. A number of signed testimonies by pilgrims whose candles lit spontaneously attest to the validity of these ignitions. The person who experiences the miracle from close up by having the fire on the candle or seeing the blue light usually leaves Jerusalem changed. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Indeed, we are saved through Christ's shed blood not an idol opening its eyes. The enemy can come as an angel of light, he is a deceiver of the brethren. We are not saved through idols or rituals, but belief in our hearts that Jesus died for our sins and washed us clean. Is it really where Jesus Christ was crucified and buried? 
The Church of the Holy Siler is one of the most important sites in Christianity and is widely believed by tradition to be the place where Jesus Christ died and was resurrected. But when it comes to the Church of the Holy Siler, many people doubt whether it is really where Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected. Is Jesus's tomb really there? Currently, the Church of the Holy Siler itself has a strange and complicated arrangement of control known as a status quo, meaning it is controlled by several different Christian denominations at once. This precarious balance is maintained by an understanding of the status quo going back to 1757, and all of it is reflected by the infamous immovable ladder. But just how important is the Church of the Holy Siler? First, we are going to find out when the Church of the Holy Siler was built and who built it. According to traditional accounts, the church itself was built in the 4th century CE after Roman Emperor Constantine the Great legalized Christianity. He had sent his mother, Helena, to look for Jesus's tomb in Jerusalem. Supposedly, she found the true cross at the site of Jesus's crucifixion near a tomb on the location of a pagan temple dedicated either to Jupiter or Venus. The temple was torn down, with a rock-cut tomb being revealed underneath, which was assumed to be the tomb of Jesus Christ. The Church of the Holy itself was then built over the site and consecrated in 335, originally called the Church of the Anasis, meaning resurrections. Over the years, the church has been damaged and destroyed several times, such as by earthquakes. The Sassanid Empire, the then incarnation of the Persian Empire, destroyed the Church of the Holy Siler in a fire in 614, and it was rebuilt 16 years later in 630. The Fatimid Caliphate ordered the Church of the Holy Siler's destruction, though it wasn't aimed specifically at the Church so much as it was a targeted campaign against Jewish and Christian holy sites and houses of worship throughout the region. It was then rebuilt and redecorated. Later, this continued over the centuries, as did occasional expansions and renovations, the most recent of which was in 2022. Several candidates lay claim to being the tomb of Jesus, some of which aren't even in the region at all. Two of the most well-known alternative possible tombs of Jesus are also in Jerusalem. One of them, the Talpiot tomb, was found in the 1980s in Jerusalem's Talpiot neighborhood. This was supported by the presence of a grave that is seemingly labeled Yeshua bar Yosef, which would translate to Jesus. However, it is widely accepted that this is a coincidence and is likely someone with the same name, since there are signs that the tomb belonged to a wealthy Judean family. Another of these tombs is the Garden Tomb found in the 19th century in Jerusalem. This tomb is even older than Jesus was, and while it presents some issues with its location and history, it is still accepted by some Christian denominations as being the tomb of Jesus. In particular, the Mormons and some evangelical Protestants. Some academics think that it is the most likely location for Jesus's tomb, but the Church of the Holy Siler is still the most widely accepted location and has been for over 600 years. The tomb itself has some evidence as the correct site too. The New Testament has said that Jesus was crucified and buried outside the walls of Jerusalem. There are reasons for this because burials in ancient times were almost always outside the city. The method of crucifixion was a common form of execution during the Roman Empire, reserved for the most severe criminals. Crucifixion typically took place outside city walls as a form of public display and deterrence. In the case of Jesus, it is believed that he was crucified at a location known as Golgotha, which was located outside Jerusalem's walls. After Jesus was crucified, according to the New Testament, he was buried in a tomb that was also located outside the city. This burial site, known as the Garden Tomb, has been a significant religious site for Christians who believe that Jesus was buried there before his resurrection. The New Testament's account of Jesus' crucifixion and burial outside the walls of Jerusalem carries both historical and symbolic significance. It speaks to the nature of Jesus' mission and his identification with the marginalized, as well as fulfilling ancient prophecies. At the time Jesus would have lived, the old city of Jerusalem's walls would not have extended as far as they do now, and the Church of the Holy Siler would have been outside them. 
This has been supported by archaeological evidence as well, indicating that the second wall was built around the church later. As time went on, the city of Jerusalem underwent numerous changes and expansions, shaping the landscape that we see today. The development of the second wall around the Church of the Holy Siler highlights the significance of this religious site and its evolution over the centuries. During the time of Jesus, the city of Jerusalem would have looked vastly different from what it is today. The old city walls would have constrained the city to a smaller area, with the Church of the Holy Siler lying outside these walls. This positioning outside the city limits would have carried symbolic meaning, as religious sites often held importance beyond mere physical boundaries. Archaeological evidence further corroborates this historical context, showcasing the gradual expansion of Jerusalem's walls to encompass significant sites like the Church of the Holy Siler. These findings shed light on the architectural and urban development of ancient Jerusalem, offering insights into the cultural and religious landscape of the time. As the city grew and evolved, so too did its religious and cultural significance. The construction of the second wall around the Church of the Holy Siler signals a shift in priorities and recognition of the importance of this sacred site. It reflects the interplay between faith, history, and architecture in shaping the identity of Jerusalem as a spiritual center. Overall, the changes in Jerusalem's city walls and the placement of religious sites like the Church of the Holy Siler reflect a dynamic interplay between the physical and spiritual realms. These developments underscore the rich history of Jerusalem and its enduring legacy as a place of profound religious and historical significance. Who opens the Church of the Holy Siler? Since at least the 12th century, the doors of the Church of the Holy Siler have been controlled by the Naseba family, the oldest Muslim family in Jerusalem, and the Jauda family. Both families continue to hold this authority to this day, having the keys to the church that is thought to house Jesus' tomb. Surely there will be many people here who are curious about whether we can visit this sacred place now or not. The answer is yes, entrance is free, although some parts of the church might be closed for ceremonies depending on the day. Every year, millions of tourists flock here to pray and bring their hearts closer to God. Let's take a quick tour of this holy place. When we come to Jerusalem, the most striking structure on the Temple Mount in the old city of Jerusalem is the Golden Dome of the Rock. The rock is believed in Judaism to be the spot where God created the first human, Adam. It is also believed that it is this site where Abraham attempted to sacrifice his son Isaac. It is said to have a divine presence, and it is towards which the Jews turn to pray. Not far from these holy shrines, we can spot two blue domes of the Church of the Holy Siler, the most holy place of Christianity. Christ was crucified and resurrected on this spot, originally located outside the city of Jerusalem, this was known as Mount Calvary or Golgotha. Let's come and see Golgotha inside the church. Entrance staircase leads up to Calvary or Golgotha, the site of Jesus' crucifixion and the most extravagantly decorated part of the church. The exit from this site is down another staircase that leads to the ambulatory. Calvary has two chapels, one is Greek Orthodox, and the other is Catholic. The Greek Orthodox chapel's altar is over the Rock of Calvary, also the twelfth station of the cross. You can touch the rock through a special hole in the floor beneath the altar, be ready to wait in line as this is one of the main reasons people visit the church. You can also see the rock through protective glass on both sides of the altar. In between the Catholic and Greek altars, a statue of Mary marks the 13th station of the cross. Inside the church's entrance is the stone of anointing, believed to be where Jesus' body was prepared for burial. The modern mosaic along the wall depicts the anointing of Jesus' body. Lamps with candles and incense hang along an ornate stand over the stone. Then you can see the Aedicule, it is a small chapel housing the Holy Siler. It has two rooms, one holds the angel's stone, believed to be a fragment of the stone that sealed Jesus' tomb, and the other is the tomb of Jesus. After the 14th century, a marble plaque over the tomb now protects it from further damage caused by flocks of pilgrims. The Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, 
and Armenian Apostolic all have rightful access to the interior of the tomb, and all three hold Holy Mass there daily. Between May 2016 and March 2017, the Aedicule underwent painstaking restoration and repair to make the structure safe for visitors again.